Hello there. My name is Susanna and I'd like to welcome you to Celebrating Work and Play, a selection of photographs from Penley House Gallery and Museum's collection in Penzance in Cornwall. There are 48 images in total, ranging from 1858 all the way up to 1998, a span of 140 years. There's no rush at all. Do just stop the film whenever you'd like and share your memories and have a chat with your companions. And then when you're ready, just press start again. Our first image in the farming section shows a tractor and trailer heading towards us down the road. We have got um, the back of the trailer is absolutely jam packed with freshly cut Cornish anemones. And we've got three adults in the trailer and two children and a dog. And I've just noticed there's another dog trotting alongside as well. Now, I don't think they could fit any more into that trailer, could they? The farmer's heading back to Ponyo Farm to bunch and pack the anemones for the London and Midland market. Our next image is of Charles Tregoning, a market gardener from Galville, and the picture's taken in about 1900. And it shows Charles holding a typical long-handled Cornish shovel, which offered powerful leverage when rested on the thigh. And you can see in the background the amazing uh, backdrop he has of Mounts Bay with uh, St Michael's Mount statuesque in the middle there. Not a bad view to have from your workplace, is it? Now we have here Mr Tregear of Higher Tregeris Newbridge ploughing with horses in the 1950s. Horses were still regularly used for ploughing in the early 50s in this part of the country and Mr Tregear is here seen contentedly puffing on his pipe. He was one of the farmers who persisted with horses when other farmers had switched to tractors. The next image is called the ploughing match at St Burian in the 1950s and we can see the farmer is twisted round in the seat of the tractor concentrating really hard to make sure that the furrow he's ploughing is absolutely ruler straight. We still have ploughing matches in this part of the country. Um, you can often see signs on the edge of the road in the autumn advertising forthcoming ploughing matches. Very exciting. Our next image is going back to the 1890s and it's called Picking Narcissi in Ludgevan Parish. And you can see um, this field has a number of ladies in it working hard picking the flowers with their long skirts and aprons and this amazing headgear they're all wearing. These hats were known as gooks, G-O-O-K-S, and they were to keep the sun off the ladies and I expect uh, stopped any little insects from nipping at them as well. There's a couple of fellows there who are perhaps uh, overseeing and making sure everything um, is as it should be. In the background, again, we have St Michael's Mount uh, rising up in the distance there. The next image shows um, people packing Narcissi on the Scilly Isles in 1900. This was just the year before Queen Victoria died and we can see the very formal Victorian clothing that the ladies are, and gentlemen are wearing. But what I find absolutely amazing about this image is that the flowers are all in full bloom. 
Now that's so different, isn't it, to the way we um, buy daffodils and narcissi these days. When we purchase them, they're all in tight bud and they only come out into complete flower once they're into our warm living rooms. Probably the difference would be that uh, in the, uh, those days the rooms were much cooler, weren't they? There was no central heating. So perhaps it worked out just fine for the flowers to be in full bloom uh, from the moment they arrived in the home. Can you just imagine that fragrance in that room? Almost overpowering, I would imagine. Our next image is called Dropping Seed Potatoes from the 1950s. Seed potatoes were usually planted in about February if the weather permitted and the steep slope here would have made the planting difficult but I guess the drainage would have been good. Uh, Cornish new potatoes have always been a speciality haven't they and they've uh, used to be sent up to Covent Garden for the markets there. I don't know if they still are but uh, I certainly love them very much. This image shows a combine harvester from the 1950s. Now, in this case, the combine is not self-propelled. It's being pulled along by the tractor. And I wonder if it was the case then, as I think it is now, in that not every farmer would own his own combine, but there may be one owned in the district. And when that particular farmer has got his uh, crops in and saved, he will then hire out his combine for the other local farmers to use. This charming image is called Three January Lambs from Manor Farm, Pendine in 1956. And we see the lady there um, holding these triplet lambs. And that was pretty special because generally when three lambs were born, it wasn't unusual for one of them to die. So they are very precious there and looking very healthy. Um, my eyes are drawn to those zip-up boots. I wonder if any of you ever had them before. Uh, I know my mother had some and uh, uh, you, you would sink your foot inside the sheepskin lining and then whiz up the zip and suddenly you were transported into a little bit of uh, sort of cosy heaven. Um, they were a bit big for me so I used to go clomping round in them but I was extremely happy. Here we have a farmer working with his horse in a field of broccoli and the, what they're doing here is taking a plough along the sides of the row of the broccoli plants and earthing them up to protect them against uh, the strong winds. Broccoli used to have the stumps about 45 to 50 centimetres high so the earth would actually protect them from being snapped by the, um, the high winds and the horse needs to be quite strong to pull that plough along and you can see he's carefully placing his feet so that he doesn't crush all the vegetables. These days um, it's no longer needed as uh, broccoli plants are smaller so they don't need earthing up in the same way. This image is called When Things Don't Go So Well and it's a picture from Galville in 1956 and you can see these two farmers despondently looking at this field of broccoli after three weeks of frost. And you can see that the actual leaves have all flopped over and the curds in the centre, the white part of the broccoli, is a sort of brown and um, sort of rotting. So that whole field of crops is now spoilt and cannot be sold. So very sad. We now move on to our fishing section and we actually start with our earliest photo of all. This is from 1858 and it shows a lad um, carrying a heavy basket of fish on his head. You can see the size of the basket compared to him. And uh, it was interesting how children were a common part of the workforce. I wonder were any of you working when you were children? I expect you were doing hard work helping out. Perhaps you have a chat about that. 
Our next image is Landing Crabs by in New Lynn Harbour in the 1980s. And here we have the skipper and owner Michael Hosking at landing a basket of crabs from the Silver Harvester. And she was the largest vessel to fish from New Lynn, having a long and successful career beam trawling and trawling from mackerel. Our next image uh, goes back in time and this is from about 1955 and we've got a record catch by the St Ives gig Cape Cornwall of 1,500 stone of pilchards. The crew took over seven hours to land the catch off Wolf Rock fishing grounds and every net was filled to capacity. I bet the boat was really low in the water as they came back. I wonder how they unload the fish off the boat, um, whether other boats come alongside. I expect they have to. Um, but you can see they're not actually moored along the quay. They're uh, moored alongside another um, boat with its uh, engine puffing away next to it. This is a lovely image called um, From the Penzance uh, Pilchard Trade in the 1890s. Now Cornish salt pilchards or Salace Inglesi had been exported from Cornwall to Italy for over 450 years. And here we've got hogsheads of pilchards lined up ready to be loaded for Italian destinations such as Naples, Genoa, Venice and Livorno. From there, the ships often sailed to the Black Sea from where they returned with cargoes of grain. Now, the yearly average shipments at this time were between 20,000 and 30,000 hogsheads of fish. Amazing. Here we have a woman and man standing uh, on the right of the picture and they're picking pilchards or fair maids as they were known out of a wicker basket while the man on the left is using a tool to press the fish in downwards into the wooden barrel. The fish was salted and pressed into barrels and then exported. Here we have a wonderful picture of um, these ladies who are packing um, pilchards and they're obviously somebody's um, made a joke and they're all having a, a real giggle about that. I wonder, did you um, have laughs at work when you were um, out there in the workforce? Were there plenty of giggles to be had or was it always a very serious business? Our last image in our fishing section is of a basket maker. Basket making has always been an important Penzance industry. And in 1883, there were 16 basket makers producing on average 100,000 baskets a year. And in this image um, from the 1920s, uh, the crab pot's being constructed on its mould, which is a post which has a hardwood disc on the top. And holes are drilled in circles of the required diameter. Uh, for a lobster pot, it was eight inches, a crab pot, nine inches, and a store pot was 10 inches. So here we have um, this wonderful industry with a little lad sitting on one of the completed pots. Moving on to our mining section, our first image is from about 1890 at Harvey's Foundry in Hale. And we've got workers in front of a beam for a 70 inch diameter cylinder beam engine in the yard of the foundry. Beam engines were an important part of the mining industry in Cornwall and they would all be used to pump out the flood water that was all often collecting in, in a lot of the mines and also to power the stamps or the crushing mechanism for um, smashing up the ore uh, once it had come out of the ground. 
This next image is another very early one, again from 1858. And we've got uh, a picture of um, four young chaps there posing for the photograph. And we've got the younger lads in front and then the older boy at the back holding some candles. Now, um, at this time, it was very common for boys and girls to work at the mine from the age of eight, first doing lighter jobs on the surface. And at about 12 to 14 years, the boys went underground. The girls continued to work on the dressing floor as bow maidens, engaged on the heavier tasks of spalling, which was breaking with hammers and sorting the ore. Now we assume the boy at the back, as he's holding two candles, we must assume he's already working underground. The candles would be made of animal fat known as tallow and some mines actually made all the miners buy their candles. They thought that if they um, gave them to them free then they might sell them. Uh, in, in certain circumstances, miners, if they were doing a very repetitive job underground and they could do it without actually watching, they would snuff out their candle to conserve it and maybe at the end of the week they would have a stub of candle that they could um, use for their family. Here we have an amazing image taken underground at East Pool Mine in 1893. And you can see um, the, actually the photographer who took this image, his wife is sitting on a rock on the left. Um, I bet her clothes were in the right state when she got up to the surface again. And then we've got five miners posing, standing on the tram road there um, for the photograph. In an interview with Charles uh, Burrow, the photographer, he has said, I have had, say, half a dozen assistants, some miners, some not, climbing almost perpendicular ladders, one with a camera strapped to his back, others carrying boxes, gas cylinders, tripod legs, etc. Then suddenly there has been a shout of, My box is slipping! And away it goes, fathoms below, and the day's work must be given up. If you think about it, it's actually a really amazing photograph because that mine would be pitch black. So to have got this lighting and this image done so incredibly well um, is just a marvel, isn't it? Moving on to the 1950s, we've got some miners at Giva here and um, they're in front of the Victory shaft with its new steel headgear and electric winders. Now, um, on their heads, they've got sort of tougher hats than those miners with the candles had before them. And they've got carbide lamps there, uh, which would create a really bright but open flame. In the top half of the lamp would be water with a sort of valve in it and it would be gradually opened up and the water would drip on little chips of calcium carbide which would be in the lower part of the lamp. And the two, when the water landed on the carbide it would create acetylene gas and then that would be lit at the front of the lamp. It created a really, really bright flame. So it was um, a great progress from uh, the candle days, but it was still an open flame. We're moving on to our working days section. And we start off with an image of, of the chap called William Arnold Snell. And he was a monumental mason in Newlyn. And he often worked in stone and his work can be seen in many local cemeteries and such places as the West Granite Front of Penzance Market Hall. Various war memorials and also a memorial to the crew of the Lugger Mystery on the wall of the Seaman's Mission in Newlyn. This photograph so shows his artistic adaptability and uh, what he'd been doing is for a few weeks he was carving the heads of Our Lord and St Peter from the mahogany wood of old billiard tables. A real craftsman there. 
And another uh, fabulous craftsman was Bert Dyer here, who had trained as a precision engineer with a firm of compass makers. And in his uh, workshop in Mausel, he showed that he could tackle almost any job, large or small, however intricate or whatever le level of accuracy was needed. He was influenced by the Newlin industrial class and created very fine copper. And a hand-wrought kettle won him first position in a London exhibition in the 1920s. This is uh, called Dustbin Man, St Just in the 1970s. And the dustbin man here is Sidney Prowse, who also sometimes drove the bin lorry. Um, note the galvanised bins that were universally used at this time to withstand any hot ash that was thrown in from the coal fires. I don't think hot ashes manage very well in, black, in our black bags or wheelie bins, do you? I wonder who cleaned the grate in your house when uh, you were growing up? And in fact, did you have an open fire or gas or electric? Now, this is a wonderful image. Oh, it's called Giving Humphrey Davy a Good Clean in Penzance in the 1950s. And Humphrey Davy was a famous son of Penzance um, and he was a wonderful inventor. He invented this special lamp that was safe to use in the mines, even in the presence of flammable gases, um, and it didn't explode. Uh, he discovered six new elements, would you believe, including sodium and potassium. And he also discovered the pain relieving effect of laughing gas uh, and then suggested its use for anaesthesia. Now, the statue here was built in 1872, costing £600, and it was paid for by the people of Penzance. Here we have Wash Day in Mausel at about 1946. And we can see this young lady pinning up the clothes um, on a, a line in the alleyway there, I think. And I'm just looking over at that, those railings. Do you think perhaps those are fishing nets drying, uh, hanging over the side of the railings? I think they might be. Now, this is taking us back to the 1890s again, and uh, we've got uh, Samuel Gavid was a butcher from St Blasey who took his wares out to the neighbouring villages. And uh, you can see here he's got horse-drawn cart and he's got everything he needs um, in the back of his um, trailer there. Now, I wonder if this brings back as, memory, men, uh, as many memories for you as it does for me. And we've got um, this uh, image is called All Aboard from 1957. And this has got the, uh, Mr. B.C. Trott, who was the guard of the Cornish Riviera Express on his final trip from Penzance before his retirement. But just look at those lovely doors. Do you remember how um, the window would just sort of slide down with that strange sort of lip of metal at the top? And I'm looking behind him to, uh, it's reminding me of the corridor and the individual carriages um, that uh, had sliding doors to open into them. And do you remember the uh, sort of uh, netting luggage racks that were at the top? And if you wanted to open a window, you had a leather strap at, with holes in it and then there was a button on the, uh, beneath the window and you could adjust how far open the window was. And I do remember sort of putting my nose outside the window and you could smell that incredible uh, smoky uh, sort of black smuts of the um, coal-fired engine. Here we have three members of the Penzance National Fire Service in 1930 and they're posing with their helmets at a jaunty angle on a fire engine presented to the borough of Penzance by Richard Foster Belitho. They look in very fine spirits, don't they? This wonderful picture is of the staff of T. 
T.B. Wilton and Roberts Ironmongers in on Market Jew Street in 1899. And they certainly have an amazing array of uh, lamps in that right-hand window, don't they? Together with that huge one in the doorway advertising um, their supplies. I love those uh, great big high stack of, of uh, I guess, they're, are they leather or tin trunks? Those um, suitcases there. Uh, and also we've got a collection of ladders on that left-hand side. And in the left-hand window, we've got brooms and brushes and um, uh, also some bird cages, whatever you might need. Uh, interesting whether you were born uh, into uh, lamp light or to electric light. Um, lots of people I've spoken to over the years, um, if they were born in the country, they had uh, lamps for a light, paraffin lamps, and the wicks would need to be trimmed every day. And then other folk I've met uh, were born in the cities and they electric light came to them quite early on and they remember um, all the sort of wires from the electric lights sort of festooning round the pelmet. Um, but then they had this instant illumination. This is a great picture, isn't it? It's from a grocery shop in Penzance in the 1950s. I just love the fact that they've got virtually everything you might want. We've got sweets in jars, we've got camphorated oil, matches, lion's tea, cocoa, toilet rolls, uh, everything you can imagine. And we've got Vim top, on the top right hand corner. And I remember uh, those cardboard tubs of Vim, don't you? And they were, it was really like sort of pulverised grit. But whenever you cleaned the bath with it, there was never any um, sort of residual uh, problem left, doesn't it? Who knows how much enamel it would scrape off at the time, but it was certainly really effective. <laughs> Here we're moving on to our leisure section and our first image is called Snowman on the Beach from Penzance in 1950. Now snow is such a rarity in West Cornwall that Harry Penhall, the photographer, found it worthwhile to photograph it. Pictured here on the beach are two well-dressed school children putting the finishing touches to their maritime snowman. I love his sort of beach stone buttons and those seaweed arms, don't you? Now this next image is an absolute delight. It's for, called Men About Town and it was from Mausel in about 1946. And it shows these little school children outside the Kegwin Arms in Mausel, which is one of only two remaining buildings dating before the Spanish attack on Mounts Bay devastated Mausel in 1595. And what's absolutely delightful about this photograph is how it encapsulates the childhood sense of wonder and adventure. Back in time again, we've got the Corpus Christi Fair in Penzance in about 1900. And we've got here, we've got four ladies are getting aboard uh, what seems to be advertised as a mountain railway trip, which just cost one penny. And uh, they may be looking a little bit apprehensive there, aren't they? I hope they don't get too frightened. Um, but they're certainly, uh, there's a bit of a queue formed um, below on the right. So um, once they've had their turn, those other ladies are going to be climbing aboard, I think. Here we have um, Coco the Clown outside the Ritz Cinema in Penzance in 1957. Nikolai Polyakov was the creator of Coco the Clown, arguably the most famous clown in the UK during the middle decades of the 20th century. Here he is from Bertram Mill Circus presenting road safety certificates and badges to children thronging outside the Ritz. He was such a well-loved character that when in 1953 he was made bankrupt due to arrears of taxes, he received hundreds of contributions from children who sent sixpences and shillings to alleviate his distress. 
Now, I think this is one of my most favourite images in the whole show. This little lad seems to be enjoying his milk and snack. Um, giving children one third of a pint of full cream milk a day in school was a wartime measure to improve children's health. But judging by the holes in this little chap's jumper, money was short in his family, and so the free school milk would certainly have been a bonus. Do you remember having school milk? Did you like it? Um, I'm afraid I wasn't ever a fan, but I'd love to hear what uh, your memories are of it. Here we have a wonderful picture called Sandcastles on Carbis Bay from about 1949. And here we've got this group of four little girls uh, all digging a lovely sandcastle there. Um, I don't know that the little girl on the left seems quite dressed for the occasion, does she? She seems to have her winter jumper on and her kilt. Um, and I don't know that she's quite into the activity yet. But certainly the young uh, girl on the uh, right hand side has, um, is dressed for action. She's pushed her sleeves up. She's got her costume on with her little jumper on over the top. And she's getting um, sort of very engaged in it. I love the look of the two little toddlers there who are um, not quite sure what's going on perhaps, but they're just still very pleased to be um, involved in anything that the big girls are doing. Um, do you remember those little bobbly uh, swimsuits this little the girls are wearing? Um, I remember having one of those. Now this is called Leapfrog on the Beach from 1946. And uh, this shows uh, two YWCA girls in holiday mood at one of the um, hiking parties organised by Miss Brown each week. And uh, you can see um, one of them uh, who's leaping over the top has got one of those bobbly swimming suits we talked about just now. But the one being leapt over, I think that will be a wool swimsuit. I don't know if any of you ever had one of those. Uh, I seem to hear that they were extremely scratchy and when they got wet, they used to sort of sag alarmingly. Now this image makes me uh, laugh just looking at it. You can see that people are absolutely having a ball. Um, but there seems to be a bit of a difference in um, how much laughter there is on this side of the auditorium compared to over on the far side. Um, people are certainly uh, absolutely um, falling over themselves, giggling. I should think it's pretty noisy over this side, um, but they're much more restrained on the far side of the room. I think I'd rather be with this group, don't you? Now we're moving on to um, the pantomime in Helston in 1956. We've got men dressed as women, a woman dressed as a man, a pantomime horse. What more could you want? I do notice the blue anchor in sign on the stage backdrop. Have you ever had so much fun? Oh, no, we haven't. Oh, yes, you have. We're at the Jubilee Pool in Penzance in 1994 now. And the actress Jan Harvey grew up playing in the UK's largest art deco seawater lido, the Jubilee Bathing Pool. Hundreds joined her for the reopening of Penzance's famous landmark. What could be better than a good Cornish rugby match? Here the one is at Menhay Fields in Penzance in 1956. Moving on here, we have um, the adjacent Hunt's Maiden Race at Tahiti Point to Point in 1957. Um, I seem to remember that the um, Tahiti Point to Point was classically on Easter Monday. Have I got that right? Maybe you'll be able to let us know of other um, point to points that you've been to in Cornwall in uh, the past. I absolutely love this picture. 
these five little scallywags are playing the May horns in Penzance in the 1930s. And if I sort of take you back um, to a previous time when the Mayhorn celebration was on, there was a writer to the Cornishman uh, newspaper from Manchester described his experiences in Penzance and did not seem to be very enthusiastic. He said, At about four o'clock on May morning, I was awakened by a noise such as might be a delirious jackass. When I had collected my scattered wits, I found that someone was blowing a huge tin horn in the street below the window. The din was kept up more or less all day. And that was from the 5th of June, 1902. Clearly, it didn't meet with his approval, did it? This looks like it was a whole lot of fun, doesn't it? It's a carnival on St Mary's in the Isles of Scilly in 1960. Um, the wheels may be about to fall off um, their float, but this group of pirates um, seem to be meaning business um, as they uh, take their pirate ship through the town. This is one of my favourite pictures in the show. I don't know about you. This is the winners of the comic dog class in a dog show at Helston in 1955. On the left, we have Mrs M Bates with Candy and uh, she's clearly being uh, a nurse with uh, Candy's being a, a baby and she's got the baby's bottle there. And then in the middle, we've got a young lady um, with her red riding hood cape on with her trusty uh, dog there playing the part of the, um, you know, the naughty wolf with some glasses on and a bonnet. And then on the right, we've got a lovely little uh, scene with the girly in her nurse's uniform and her long-suffering dog um, being the patient. An absolute beauty, isn't it? The final image in our show is of Maisie Day Galawan in Penzance in 1998. This is the most recent of the photographs. And uh, we've got in the week leading up to Maisie Day each year, there is an election of the mock mayor. And on Maisie Eve, a fireworks display with the appearance of Penglaz, Penzance's own obios, accompanied by the Galawan band. And here we have Maisie Day has finally arrived and six members of the Cape Cornwall Singers are singing on Causeway Head. So that's the end of our show today. Thank you so much for joining me and we'd love to hear what you think of this film. So please, um, if you have any comments, contact us um, as you see on the screen there and look forward to more videos we have from Penley House Gallery and Museum. Bye.